Hey everybody, it's Kelly. Welcome back to another episode of Ask a Therapist. Today we are talking about weird things Christians say. On my social media outlets, I put a question for anybody who wanted to answer to tell me some weird things that they have heard Christians say. And I got a lot. Some of them were quite often repeated, and I will tell you which ones were kind of the most common, but I do want to remind you if you find any of this helpful or relate to any of this to go ahead and check out my purity culture or religious trauma playlists on the channel, and don't forget to subscribe. We're going to start off with an easy one. Christians seem to call anything that is not living in Christianity a lifestyle. I, for one, as a member of the LGBTQIA plus community, find this wholly offensive. The idea that something is a lifestyle, the power of that statement and what that statement insinuates very much comes from the words that they don't say. When someone has talked about living in a lifestyle or living a certain lifestyle, the word that's left off there but implied is choice, a lifestyle choice. And that goes back to exactly what many evangelical Christians assume about people within the queer community, which is that it is a choice to belong to the community, to tell people you're part of the community, and to live as part of the community. I choose what I put on in the morning. And yes, I choose who to be with in a romantic way. And I choose what I allow people to know about me. I don't choose who I am. I am who I am, and I choose who I let into that. In reality, it's not, I guess, entirely wrong that it is a choice. The choice isn't do I marry and live the rest of my life with my wife, or do I marry a man and live the way society expects me to live. The choice is, am I true to who I am, or am I true to who society wants me to be? That's the choice. Given the choice between being fake or being authentically who you are, that the choice then is clear and people should be able to be authentically who they are without who they are being relegated to a lifestyle. There's an umbrella of phrases that Christians use, very Christianese type things. Hedge of protection. Power in the blood. That was a powerful witness. The use of the word fellowship as a verb. These are very specifically Christian things to say and words to use. The reason they are used is essentially like a little club. Every group of people has its own lingo, and this is Christianity's version of having its own vocabulary. Exclusionary language keeps people out. I'm not entirely convinced that for many evangelical Christians, keeping people out is a problem. Another one is, I'll pray for you, and closely related, sending thoughts and prayers. More than enough has been expressed in social media about how ridiculous the sending thoughts and prayers actually is when it comes to things that need action, that require a response, that require people to stop being passive and be engaged in what's happening, right? The idea of the I'll pray for you, I've witnessed many times being just really offensive for people. Someone who doesn't necessarily see anything wrong with it and sees someone who's hurting says, I'll pray for you. And if that person that they're talking to doesn't subscribe to their theology, or maybe doesn't subscribe to prayer, or to religion in general, that's actually offensive. Telling someone that you are going to invoke whatever it is you believe in on their behalf does no good for the person who doesn't believe in what you believe in, right? Where it becomes even more of sort of a passive aggressive thing now is, I don't know if any of you are on Twitter, but I've had that tweeted at me multiple times where people are just mad at something I've said or don't agree with where I'm coming from. They're like, well, I'll pray for you. What does that mean? Because your prayer is going to be that I'm going to start thinking like you or I'm going to be like you or your version of God is going to come in and just fix me right up and change how I do things. It's a passive aggressive way to tell someone that you find nothing about them acceptable and they need a higher power in order to be acceptable to you. Where thoughts and prayers has become so egregious to people is where it is imposed into places there should be action. When a tragedy has occurred, especially a tragic loss of life, people say our thoughts and prayers are with the victims and their families, or our thoughts and prayers are with these people, or our thoughts and prayers are with this country that's undergoing this traumatic thing. But thoughts and prayers don't actually do anything. Let's say you're a Christian and you're praying. There is no denomination of Christianity that I'm aware of that does not also require you to act. Because the Bible that you say that you subscribe to says faith without works is dead. So your prayers don't mean anything if you're not also acting on helping people who need your help. Which is why for most people, thoughts and prayers don't mean anything and is actually a laughable phrase now because it's not accompanied with any change or any expectation of any action except for just to say it. 
somewhere on your social media. This one has come up a couple of different times and it may warrant its own video. Let me know in the comments if you think that it does, but it's this theory that God is always watching. So God being omnipotent and omnipresent and just always involved in everything and also knows your thoughts. This has created for people a reasonable bit of paranoia and discomfort. The idea that this all-knowing entity is involved in every aspect of your life is maybe on some level meant to be comforting. In reality, it just feels punitive and like anything you do or any thought you think or anything that is out of bounds or not what God wants is going to be trouble for you that you're going to be in trouble for it or that you're going to lose points in the rating scale that decides if you're a good person because God is always watching you can never hide from that entity right the idea that you're always being watched just makes you feel on display all the time. That's not comforting. That doesn't take you to a place where you feel cared for and that makes you want to share a religion with people. That takes you to a place where you want to hide things and be more secretive and be more duplicitous in the way that you live your life. That way the Christian people that you talk to and spend time with only know that part of you and you keep this other part hidden. Let's talk about God's plan. The number of times that Christians use God's plan as a way to validate something terrible that's happened is a lot. The number is a lot. If I experience a death of someone close to me in my life, the things that Christians say to me to comfort me is, That's God's timing. Or it's part of God's plan for them to go now. Who does that comfort? I mean, really, who do you think that's comforting? Because it's not comforting anyone but the speaker. The person who's saying, oh, it's part of God's plan. They're easing their own sense of guilt or their discomfort at someone else's pain or their own pain related to other people who've died. That has nothing to do with the person they're speaking to. That is all selfishly spoken. Stop saying that. If you are a Christian, God's plan is not something that you know. So don't talk like you do know it. If you're talking to someone who's not a Christian, God's plan means nothing to them if they don't worship the same God that you worship. These last two were the most commonly shared. So here we go. The first one is a personal favorite of mine. Hate the sin, but love the sinner. The amount of hubris that is required for cishet people to assume that you can extract someone's sexuality, identity, understanding of self from who they are, all the while not ever contemplating that it's not something they can extract from themselves is mind-blowing for me. The idea of hate the sin but love the sinner is something that got started with purity culture as an effort to be able to keep people in your sphere and positively influence them towards God, but also make sure they know that they are not acceptable and that what they are doing is not acceptable. It has become completely focused on the queer community, and it is the way that some churches pretend like they're accepting and affirming when in reality they're just looking for more bodies and more money. When people say hate the sin but love the sinner, they're reducing parts of a person to actions or actually they're reducing them to their assumed actions. Because if I say to someone that I'm married to a woman, where they take that next, what they assume that means in all senses of the term, is on them. I've just said, I have a legal contract with another adult who, yes, is female. And we share things like a domicile and insurance. That's all I've shared. Anything else that's assumed there is on the person listening, which is offensive in the way that it sexualizes people and their relationships. Beyond that, it's closed-minded and not really understanding of people as whole and created individuals, which Christians say they see people as. You can't hate something so significant about me and still make me think you love me. That's not how it works. This one is one that I had a problem with big time when I worked in the church. Less of a problem now because it doesn't get said to me anymore. And that is that God doesn't give you more than you can handle. The depths that we could mine in the problematic theology in this statement are astounding. And also, I'm not going to do that today. But the reason it's such an egregious thing is because, number one, it insinuates to people who believe in God that God is directly harming them, but thinks they're strong, so... Buck up, buckaroo. It'll be okay. What God do you want to believe in that's throwing terrible things at you because, well, they know you're strong? 
it's giving they make fun of you because they like you energy right that's that's kind of where i'm at and that's toxic as is this idea. When you say this is someone in a Christian setting, if anyone does sort of push back against it, they push back against it in a way that says, well, God will give you more than you can handle in order to make you rely on him. So let's get this straight. You're worshiping a God that is going to remove all of these things from your life and things that you love and care about in order to make you love them more. What? I'm not sure what theological basis there is in believing this, but I've never been aware of any in the time that I worked in the church. And again, being out of the church now, it's even more toxic. This idea, again, makes the people saying it feel better and not the person they're saying it to. The person who's saying it feels like they don't want to get close to that person's pain. They want to put distance. They want to put it in a box. They want to make sure that there's an assigned meaning to it so that they can differentiate it from their own pain and therefore keep their own pain back. So in saying this, you're just making yourself feel better. And honestly, if I'm hurting, I don't care about making someone else feel better at that moment. That moment gets to be about me. That's it for today. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you all next week. And until then, take care of yourselves and each other.